Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 159. So glad you could join me. Uh, today's guest is January Gill O'Neill. She'll be here in about 15 minutes. But before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this. We love poetry, and I know you do too. So please do click the like button and share. Make sure you're subscribed, all that good stuff. Anything you can do to help poetry spread around the internet would be much appreciated. Um, we're up to like 3,500 subscribers on YouTube, which is great. Um, if you can subscribe there, do it and click stuff um, over on iTunes and all that. Whatever you can do, help us out by subscribing and sharing. Now, we'd like to start, and we'll see if we have uh, Rick Lupert on in a little bit. He said he might be running late to get here. Um, but we have Tuesday's poet, a preview of tomorrow's poem that nobody has ever read, Hot Off the Presses. We have a poem by uh, John Hodgen called Quiet Quitting, and we have uh, John on the line right now. Hey, John, how you doing? I'm okay. How are you? I'm doing great. So um, we have this, I just, people are going to see this beautiful poem, which I just love, um, that's going to appear on Tuesday. But tell us about what inspired it and, and the new story that, that it came about from. Yeah, that's a, a horse with uh, many heads, I think. There's, there's that um, news item that, that seems pretty intriguing, that a lot of people are starting to feel like they don't want to commit to the work world anymore the way that we used to. That, that whole traditional way of going to work and expecting to figure out who you are and what you mean and how much you can contribute to the company and all that. Oh, how that's seemingly under revision with um, the great resignation and all that. But suddenly... Um, the phrase quiet quitting or just the words quiet quit um, hit hit me harder than I thought it might. I, I read the article. I, I took it in. I, I completely understand. And I'm not thinking purely negative here that that um, the quiet quit suggests something that's that's a negative. It isn't necessarily that some people are sitting at work and they're. <laughs> They're maybe not so committed to the work world that they knew before. They're committed to, to a dream of maybe making something else out of their lives. Uh, and I didn't do any of that in the poem. The other thing, if, if you write, and I know you do, most of you out there, I know you do. Sometimes a phrase just invites you in. It just traps you and takes you where it wants to go, if that makes any sense at all. Quiet quit, to me, just those two words that are so similar and yet so opposed to each other. Um, I couldn't help but hear that as a way to suggest how we might all wish to leave this world. If, if it came to that, we'd love to have that quiet, peaceful last moment on, on the planet. And suddenly I was just overwhelmed by death images. And Tim, you, you spoke to this too, but I, I don't know what brings us into a poem sometimes, but sometimes it's just the sonics, just the, just the sounds. Those two words just were like a drum beat. And I decided to just trust where they took me, where they led me. Um, so if, if, if it's time to begin, I'll begin. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's just it's a great example of the way that sort of language has its own intelligence or something. It, it, it poems kind of generate themselves sometimes. It's an amazing process. Um, and this is quiet quitting. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and read it? I'll uh, put it on screen for sure. everybody home and, and you just read your own copy. Thanks. Quiet quit. Most of us at the end, we'll quiet quit. We'll recognize body as mystery, a history book we must return, a requirement, a requisite. Each line on our face or hand, a pink slip, a dance stamp, ultraviolet, allowing us to be returned, to readmit body as thesis, exegesis, opposite, locks it, to wit, an extra Jesus at the core of it, body, a tool and die shop, breaking bit by bit, a Morse code telegraph, dot, dot, dit, dit, even our clothes refusing to fit. Like sitting on Clint Eastwood's lawn telling everyone to get. Saying what soldiers say when they get shot. I'm hit. I'm hit. When all we want is to get lit. Like a funeral pyre. A fiery pit. 
piece of shit. Like the game is over. Like tag, you're it. Yeah, fascinating poem. Thanks so much for sharing that, John. And how often yeah. is it the, the, that you write in the style? Is that something usual for you to have the, the language and the, the music of it play out so strongly? I'm, I'm glad you asked that. That's funny. I had written a poem about quiet quitting that is nothing like this. Hmm. And then um, when I finally had beaten it into shape and thought that I had a pretty damn good poem, uh, this was one of those three o'clock in the morning times when you just wake up and suddenly it's like you're hearing all the words that wanted to get into the poem. It didn't <laughs> didn't get in. But they were the words that were like the minions or something. They just kept wanting to rhyme and jump up and down with that kind of excitement. And I don't do this all that often. I, I write all the time, but I don't usually go back and rewrite the, the same impulse, the, the same prompt, mm -hmm. but I got a very, I'm so pleased. I was so pleased to hear from you, but I get a very good feeling at the end of this poem that this was pretty damn good too. Um, but the first one, honestly, it doesn't work this way at all. So I, I'm answering your question. Sometimes, uh, sometimes you just trust where that 3 a.m. Um, moment comes from and, and get up as fast as you can and, and write it down. Um, but I, I, I think it's, conceivable that sometimes when you're done with a poem you're not and that's what happened this time yeah for sure well so glad you could share this and i'm looking forward to sharing it with everybody all of our readers tomorrow it was tuesday's poem thanks john it was great to talk to you no problem thanks a lot take care january good to see you yeah that was uh john hodgen with a uh, quiet quit that's going to be t uh the poem for the day for tomorrow and now still, um, I think Rick Looper is not going to make it here. So let's just read, uh, we'll share this poem, The Queen is Dead. Of course, that was the main topic that everybody was writing about this week. Um, Queen Elizabeth's death after 70 plus years of a, is a, of a reign as a monarch. Um, that was by far the most common poem that we received this week, the most common topic. And um, we had a lot of responses, very polarized. It was one actually weirdly one of the most polarizing subject matters uh, we've had in a while because some people, you know, talked about imperialism and, and had, you know, trouble with the praise that, that she's getting. And then other people um, just wrote praise poems. And uh, Rick Looper did something interesting and kind of in between exploring the way that um, um, uh, trying to explain our get, get to the root of our obsession, I guess, with her. And um, his, his note is just simple. Queen, is, Queen Elizabeth, the longest reigning monarch in Earth's history, died this week. Um, and here is uh, Rick Looper reading his poem, The Queen is Dead. The Queen is Dead So few people alive today have taken a single breath without Elizabeth steadying the British ship until now. She knew everyone, and everyone you've ever known knew her. What is this fascination with the British monarchy, you might ask? Is that what this is, I might answer? Or is it a love for a forever steady hand, a woman who stood at the forefront of all modern history? She saw television come and turn to color, she was in the studio when they filmed the moon landing. She saw family rebel like happens in any family, no matter how much land they own. She saw war and still had it in her eyes until the last moment. I listened to the Smiths' album, The Queen is Dead Today. Morrissey had been planning for this moment for decades. Charles, the boy who would be king since before my blood knew what to do, loved his mother, didn't keep a bag packed out of respect. What is this fascination, this terrible impermanence? Yeah, this fascination with terrible impermanence. Great way to put that, uh, Rick Lupert. Um, unfortunately, he couldn't make it, I guess. He was trying to fight his way through L.A. traffic to get here. But uh, we should have him on as a main guest, actually, sometime. So we'll, I'll ask him about that. We'll have him on sometime soon. Uh, Rick Lupert with uh, The Queen is Dead. He's kind of a local legend here in Los Angeles, runs one of the best series, uh, the Cobalt Reading Series at the Cobalt Cafe. He also does the um, Poetry Superhighway, which a lot of um, – he has his own show on Sundays – um, with a great open mic, so check that out at poetrysuperhighway.com. Uh, yeah, Rick Looper. We'll have him on as a guest, I think. That'd be great. Um, 
So uh, let's take a quick break, though, and move on to our main guest for today, which once again is uh, January Gill O'Neill. And uh, I'm going to put on some bumper music and uh, take a quick break, and we will be right back. And we're back. Thanks so much for your patience. As I mentioned, today's guest is January Gill O'Neill. She's an associate professor at Salem State University and author of uh, three books, Rewilding, which is the one we're going to be focusing on, a beautiful book that I have right here. Um, also, Misery Islands and Underlife, all published by Kevin Carey Press. Uh, from 2012 to 2018, she served as the executive director of the Massachusetts Poetry Festival, which is something I'd like to talk about personally because I do my own kind of festival stuff here, too. Um, and currently serves on the boards of AWP, Mass Poetry, and Montes, uh, Montserrat College of Art. Her poems have appeared in great places, like the best places you can possibly appear. New York Times, the Academy of American Poets, Poets of the Day series, American Poetry Review, Poetry, Plowshares, all over the place. Um, she's a recipient of fellowships from the Massachusetts Cultural Council, Cave Canem, and the Barbara Deming Memorial Fund. Um, O'Neill was also the 2019-20 John and Renee Grisham writer in residence at the University of Mississippi, Oxford. She lives with her two kids in Beverly, Massachusetts. And here she is, January O'Neill. Hey, Jan, how you doing? I'm well. How are you, Tim? I'm doing great. It's really great to see you. It's been a while. And we have, I should have mentioned, we have a, new, a poem of yours in the current issue, too, coming up, or that just released. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, do you want to start out by uh, reading something? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, I thought I would read uh, my poem, Brave, uh, from the book Rewilding, and I guess it's appropriate because it's a, it ends up being a 9-11 poem. Hmm. So um, when I first got married, our date uh, was uh, 9-15-2001. So we were supposed to fly down on 9-11 uh, or 9-12. Uh, but if you remember that time, nobody was taking off. We were all still in a state of shock. So uh, and really, it, it took me more than 10 years to, to get this poem down. But uh, I'll just say that it's in five sections. Um, it jumps back and forth in time. There's a raccoon. And um, the last stanza has three lines in it. So I'll just pause between each section. So here goes. Brave. A thin layer of ash, fine debris, probably bone, coated the windshield as we passed exit after exit for the Garden State Parkway. We took detours and back roads while police blocked every on-ramp, blue lights pulsing. Officers in yellow hazard vests stood next to their squad cars as we drove past midnight. My soon-to-be husband, mother-in-law, brother-in-law, and me in a 1992 Grand Marquis on our way to Virginia. On the radio, nothing but news and static. All of us silent, sleepy, edgy, uncertain, both absent and present on an empty highway driving past New York City. I would never tell my daughter that some nights I lie awake listening for the raccoon I know is in the attic, but pretend isn't there. 
the scratching, the heavy scampering, she hears it too. If he were here, daddy would check things out. If he were here, mommy would not feel so lonely. We pretend to be brave, bang on the walls, play loud music to scare it away. Pray it does not have kits. Marriages fail. There is no one else to go up there and get the little fucker. On our day in court, my lawyer was late, so the judge moved our case to the afternoon docket. We sat for hours, you on the left side, me on the right, listening to failure after failure, the quick dissolve of marriages into oblivion. I remember thinking, Hallmark doesn't make a card for this. The moment when the judge calls your name and uses words such as irreconcilable, broken and final, and a swell. No, a surge of tears breaks as the judge uncouples us. You cried too. Neither of us looked at the other or spoke. When I turned around, you were gone. You had left the building. Before we arrived at the hotel, we took engagement photos with our, in our wrinkled clothes. And before that, we watched the sun rise as we crossed the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. And before that, we listened to Howard Stern around 5 a.m. broadcast live, trying to find the right words, any words. And before that, you took the wheel from your brother so he could get some sleep. And before that, silence. And before that, you held my hand as we rode in the back seat. And before that, we were not allowed on the Garden State Parkway. And before that, we stopped for gas, sandwiches, checked the check engine light somewhere in Connecticut. And before that, there was a toll on the Tobin Bridge. And before that, I was on the phone with the maid of honor who would ride the bus from Texas to Virginia to arrive by Saturday. I thought she was crazy. And before that, I was on the phone with my father who said, be careful and I love you. And before that, no flights were allowed out of Logan Airport or anywhere. And before that, I said, yes. And before that, you said yes. And before that, I asked, should we go through with the wedding? I would never tell my daughter male raccoons have no part in raising their young. Yeah, great poem. That was Brave. Uh, one of the early poems on from um, January Gill O'Neill's book, Rewilding. Um, it's just a wonderful book. I you know, I read a book every week for this podcast. I never know what it's going to be because I just, it's a poet we publish and I say, oh, you have a book. Why don't you send it if you want to be a guest? And and then, you know, the day before or that morning, I finally read the book and it's just, um, it's fascinating to see what comes up. And this book is such a, a poignant thematic book about um, about divorce and the aftermath and going through all that. Um, and, and I love the central image, which is rewilding, which is sort of like D. I mean, do you want to explain how, you know, what that, that title means and, and also how you came up with it? Like, like at what point did you realize that that was the, the theme around which to write this book? You know, I think when I was putting the book together, I was probably at the point of searching for a title and I don't think I had finished all the poems in the book. So I had heard it. I, you know, I think I had a vague idea of what I wanted, but I couldn't articulate it. And I heard a TED talk um, from somebody talking about the term rewilding and thinking about, I, I think the talk was about wolves in Yellowstone National Park and how reintroducing them changed um, just the landscape, how, you know, because of the ecosystem, you know, the population of certain animals, you know, declined because we put the wolves back in. Uh, you know, there were berries growing where there weren't before. It even changed over the course of the river that was running through it. So um, I think of rewilding as, you know, um, uh, the wild part coming back. So, you know, I often think of like abandoned buildings 
and you know when we just let them completely go and nature finds a way so it's weeds and wildflowers and also birds and animals and and you know that for me that translated into coming back stronger in the broken places mm-hmm. yeah yeah, it's just a beautiful description for the 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 content moving through uh, these poems. Uh, do, do you want to read the next one? I do. Um, well, I, you know, it, since it's here, and since I don't have to look at the page number, um, uh, read "Mudlarking Dead, Dead Horse Beach." They're buried just past Winter Island, where the two lane road winds around the boardwalk at Salem Willows. Dead Horse Beach, where the cold-blooded flanks and loins of workhorses were discarded from Salem proper. Here, the earth has taken them back and given us silt. Why have I come here at low tide, mudlarking for bits of bottle and bone? Even the renegade sky has turned its back on every gray cloud to be here. It is the day before Mother's Day the kids with him for the weekend. A breeze blows the new leaves of the willow tree sideways, their low hanging branches lift and fall against the wind. And on a hill just above a family reunion, the backs of brightly colored lawn chairs face me. I hear the occasional laugh, smell the faint smell of grill. Why have I come here today? What am I looking for? I've come to take off my shoes, to feel blue and white shell fragments, beautiful broken muscles. I've come to feel ache under my feet, the deep ridges of shells worn down by salt and time with their, while their insides are luminescence. To hold one midnight in my hands is to embrace what's been lost. Fragments litter this beach, reeds, shards of driftwood, whelks, sea glass, a rusted chain, and this, a gray anchor attached to a red rope. Somewhere on the seam of sea, there's a small wish unbridled adrift. That was Mudlarking Dead Horse Beach again from Rewilding. And everybody is, is just loves Brave so much. And there's a lot of comments on both Facebook and uh, YouTube about it. And, and I actually, I was wondering this at the time, so maybe we'll go back and ask. But but how was that poem, how did that poem come to be? With the, the way that the raccoon is weaved in there. Did, the, <laughs> did, the, did you have this idea for the poem first? Yeah, like, like it's such a disparate thing. And then you, at the end with that great three-line ending, you tie it, tie it back like it was always meant to be. So... Well, I tell you, I I had that is a poem I've wanted to write. Uh, at least the experience for me, the key experience was that driving. So we're in Massachusetts. I was getting married in Virginia, which is where I'm from. Um, the experience of going driving around New York City and not being able to go through it or on the major highways. So that idea of soot and debris falling on the cars has never left me. Um, and I, you know, not that I, I didn't, I never sat down and said, I'm going to write this poem. I'm going to write an 11 poem. That was never the case, but I had taken a workshop at the fine arts work center, uh, years ago with Marie Howe. And, you know, as somebody who teaches poetry as somebody who, you know, feels like, you know, they live their lives in poetry, who kind of knows how to get in and out of things. Sometimes I feel like I can't learn anything new, but I tell you, I was in her class and she said, you know, write, I think the exercise was write a long poem, um, you know, uh, and, and play with time a little bit. And really being in the setting and sort of open to it all, it just came out, you know, and, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes poems come out and it's a gift. And I have to tell you, I don't think, you know, in, on, in the book, I stagger the lines out, um, but I mean, I think that might have been the only real change. Like I wasn't rewriting sections. I was tweaking here and there, but that poem pretty much came out as is. Interesting, you know? with and a so, raccoon too, yeah. Well, and she said, you know, put some things that don't belong. And that has become a central idea in my poetry. Mm-hmm. Um, how can you make things that shouldn't really belong 
fit together. And for me, that keeps poetry, the writing of poetry interesting. Mm -hmm. you know, how can I like, you know, why would a raccoon be in this poem in the first <laughs> place? But that was probably going on. I mean, we did have a raccoon in the ceiling. So that might have been, you know, okay, let's put the raccoon in. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's so it's just one of those things. It seems to me that like the right brain knows if the left brain doesn't. So like you're, you know, waiting to to make that connection and bring it out into words. Um, but it's, it's a great poem. Um, this whole book is full of great poems, though. Um, how uh, take us back to like the beginning of your poetry career. When did you know that you wanted to be a poet? And how did you how did you how did that come to be? Uh, I went to college at uh, Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia, and uh, I studied with Toy Derricotte and, and uh, Ruth Stone. Mm. And so I remember taking an 8 a.m. econ class and hating it. And I'm like, I can't do this because I, I, I thought I'd be a business major. But I knew I was good with words and I really enjoyed reading different things. But, you know, having the right teacher you know, can open your world. And that's what Toy Derricotte was for me. And then, you know, taking a class with Ruth Stone, that was just kind of icing. That was just fun. Mm -hmm. uh, but Toy really opened my eyes up. I mean, I, you know, I remember uh, she had, she had a cassette uh, recording of Allen Ginsberg Howl, and she had some mimeographed copies because it was a while ago uh and so we sat and we you know i you know looked at the words we looked at the words and and heard alan ginsburg read and it was just so like you can say this in a poem yeah. and so i had always been hooked uh you know with poetry but i didn't know i would be a poet i just you know just like a lot of english majors i came out in undergrad with an english degree and you know but i realized that writing and words and poetry i mean that would be my center so it kind of made like all of my other life choices easier like i you know there were things that i w was willing to do and things that i wasn't and you know so i spent some time in dc and then uh was working at the associated press and was able to get into grad school and study uh at nyu with um Sharon Olds and Galway Cannell and Philippine uh, and, you know, was able to work through grad school and, you know, but again, it was through words that made it possible. So uh, I've been, I guess, seriously writing since grad school, but I didn't, you know, I wasn't a, a, a word genius in, in high school. I didn't know really what I wanted to do back then either. It just sort of evolved, you know, and, and then putting myself into positions where I could be around other writers you know mm. i really do i i like i like uh i like i have a, a an affinity for arts administrators and people who get things done in mm -hmm. their communities i really do uh, so so why um poetry in particular do you think why do you think you're drawn to this as a medium as opposed to other forms of writing when i was at associated press i worked in the news features department uh in new york and they're the ones who do the ap style book and uh, at least they did back then. And that whole group was sort of, you know, they, they didn't do the hard news. They did, you know, fashion pieces and book reviews and music reviews. Um, and I did a few reviews and I knew that I couldn't work on deadline. That is just not me. Um, and fiction for me is just long and hard. And I all praise to people who can, um, you know, create solid narratives into and put them into books. And there's and they're wonderful. I, that is just not me. So, you know, I that is that is why I'm firmly in the poetry camp. But you know, I, I'd like to think that maybe I'm just not ready to write fiction, or I'm not ready to write essays. I mean, so many writers are branching out and they have poetry as their, their starting point. So that's, that's heartening to see. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's great to see. Yeah, well, very cool. Let's uh, let's hear the next poem. Okay, I think the next poem might be Sunday. I, I, I yeah, and that was is that okay to read? I'll read yeah. Sunday. Yeah, that was uh, that was a that was the first rattle poem. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Uh, Sunday, you are the star of the week or the end of it, and according to the Beatles, you creep in like a nun. 
You're the second full day the kids have been away with their father, the second full day of an empty house. Sunday, I've missed you. I've been sitting in the backyard with a glass of Pinot waiting for your arrival. Did you know the first sweet 100s are turning red in the garden? But the lettuce has grown too bitter to eat. I am looking up at the bluest sky I have ever seen, cerulean blue, a heaven sky no one would believe I was under. You are my witness. No day is promised. You are absolution. You are my unwritten to-do list, my dishes in the sink, my brownie breakfast, my brawless day. Um, that was Sunday, uh, another yes. poem from Rewilding. Um, you know, I, 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 you probably don't remember this because you've edited hundreds of thousands of poems, but I think I remember you contacting me way back when about it. And I think I may have had cherry 100s in the poem versus sweet 100s. And you're like, I think you said like cherry 100s, I'm not like a cigar. <laughs> Oh, here, yeah, that was, tomatoes. <laughs> that was funny. I do remember that. Yes. Um, yeah, I think I think I like I googled it because I wasn't sure what they were, and then it was, yes. it was a cigar too. And so that, yeah, exactly. Very cool. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it's a great poem, and that was from our single parent poets issue, which is a really fun issue to do. A lot of um, mm. you know, a, a lot of um, heart in those poems. Um, it really, that was issue number forty one. If anybody wants to look back and find that, yeah, you're so good that you 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 remember your issues like well, that. Well, well, I just I tweeted it on Twitter or whatever today, so I, <laughs> I looked up the number, but um, but I, I could I could not confess that and pretend that I know every number. <laughs> but I do know we're at seventy seven now, so that's uh, quite a ways back, actually. Strong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so tell us, uh, first I should say, if anybody has any questions for January, um, leave them in the chat windows on either Facebook or YouTube. That's the way to get a question to me and I will pass them along. Um, so what is your writing process like? How often do you write? Do you journal first? Do you revise a lot? Like, do you have a certain way that you go about it? Is there a certain day or at a cafe? Like, how do you, how do you enter the space of a poem? Well, uh, you know, I, I, it changes and it was different before the pandemic. It was different during the pandemic. And now it is, again, it has changed, but consistently I try to make space to write. Um, and, you know, I know I teach um, undergrads and often, you know, the sp having time to write you know, competing against everything else and every other distraction out there is difficult. So, um, you know, usually I'll sit down on my calendar and look. Right. I mean, I think really it changes uh, every academic year because mm -hmm. I never know what's popping up. But, you know, I try to find two or three hours in the day to write. And it's I don't beat myself up if it's not, uh, you know, if I skip a day or two. Um, but I I you know, when the weather's warm, I'll go sit outside on my back patio, which is something I wasn't doing, you know, three years ago, but now I'm doing it. Uh, I'll go sit at my desk and write. And if I really can't think, then I'll go to my, another place, a coffee shop and try to get something down. Um, I'd like to send, I'd like to have something finished um, once a week. Mm -hmm. And if I can sit down and write it, great. But I'm more about quantity sometimes than quality. So I'll often challenge myself with a, you know, 30 poems in a month, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the month is. So sometimes I can get some friends to, to hang with me and we'll suffer together. But I mean, like if you write 30 poems, some of them have got to work. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> how do you know a poem works? Is there a way that you can, you can feel it or do, or do you just, how do you know? No. And I tell you, I, you know, there was a point when I felt like I was in flow and I could, you know, I could do no wrong with the poem. And so I, you know, I would get a large batch, you know, six, seven, eight poems that seemed to do okay. And then I let some time pass. And then I totally forget how to write a poem or if I can write a poem. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then I, I go back and I look at my old poems and sometimes, you know, ones that I haven't tried to submit or ones that I was on the fence about, like, Sometimes I, 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 as I, as I get older, I lose objectivity. Is this a good poem? I don't know. But the ones that really end up in the books, the ones that, that um, you know, I, I get the most gratitude from or, or, you know, or a few more 
most grateful for are are the ones that you know when I when I'm done I'm like okay I've I've done something different I've said something I haven't said before mm-hmm. you know I'll often I'll often joke about you know since the pandemic you know I bought a bird feeder like everybody's got pandemic purchases mine was a bird feeder and so how many bird feeder poems can I write I mean you know so it's a matter of finding the right bird feeder poem the one that actually is you know, is like slightly better than all the others and trying to really say something that hasn't been said that I haven't said before, Mm -hmm. you know, trying to please myself really. And I don't want lame poems out there either. So, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, (laughs) uh, Kind of a follow-up question, but Cindy Gore asks, um, what do you do when you need inspiration during a slow spell? Like you mentioned going back and um, Mm -hmm. finding old poems that, is there something Mm -hmm. that you like seek out experiences i mean what do you do if you're if you're having trouble and and you're not feeling inspired i don't like to think about writer's block um but this is a broader question than that but you know in general i feel like you can do something every day for your writing Mm -hmm. so for me you know it might be revising it might be checking in with my group to see if they're you know writing or if something's clicked for them or, or if i can do something for them that's helpful Um, I read a lot and I think reading is equally as important as writing, um, you know, but also, you know, going for a walk and, you know, doing something, um, rewarding going, we have a local museum that, you know, we'll go to and, you know, see the exhibits and sometimes just being in a different space helps, but I've learned over the years, it's okay not to write and to be kind to ourselves, you know, uh, since the pandemic, really, um, you know, just getting through the day seemed like a miracle. So, you know, to, to try to produce meaningful work during that time was nearly impossible. So I just went for you know, if I could get to the page and write something that was good enough. And I've kind of maintained, you know, again, writing is practice. Mm -hmm. And so um, just sitting down and, and, and getting to the page feels like a victory. Um, So, uh, you know, I try a lot of things, but I don't, I don't beat myself up if I'm, if the words aren't coming, you know, I, because I know they will. I mean, hopefully they come sooner rather than later, but um, no, I, 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 I trust myself and my instinct and I've been through droughts before where I've, you know, figured out a way. And so there's just, just uh, really, you know, staying in touch with, uh, you know, the best parts of yourself and, and just being kind to yourself, you know, get through any kind of block, I think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's it's an interesting point. Uh, in baseball, people talk about that because a, a veteran player, you know, they've been through it. They know that they'll come out of a slump, and so they don't. You know, it doesn't sort of snowball. But a younger player, if they start struggling a little bit, who hasn't been through it, um, you know, there's a chance that that's the end of their career because they can't uh, get their head around it. So, having published three books now of poetry, um, you know, you know they're going to still come, huh? Yeah, well, I hope. I mean, there, I, I won't lie. There have been moments where I'm like, I tell my students all the time just to sit down and write, but in chair. And I have done that. And sometimes it do, the, the words don't come. But I think my job is showing up. And I try to allow enough time to, um, you know, doodle or, you know, go stare at the birds or walk the dog and, you know, you know, sometimes I have 15 minutes and I try to do what I can with 15. And sometimes I have two hours and both are strange things to do, you know, strange mm-hmm. bits of time. Uh, revision helps as well. So if I'm not uh, writing, I'll pull something old out and try to, you know, make magic, you know, yeah. whatever that is. Yeah. So. Um, well, let's hear another poem. Um, what do you want to read next? Okay. Um uh, how about Night at the Roller Palace? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. So we used to have um, <laughs> we used to have a roller skating rink that closed about three years ago, the Roller Palace. And so this is my ode to that time. Uh, but really, as a single parent, I couldn't get out to I couldn't get out to go dancing. I love dancing. So the clo- and and really, there is no place for somebody of a certain age to go dancing. So um, skating was the roller skating was the next best thing. Night at the Roller Palace. 
after the birthday crowd spin outs, after the hokey pokey and chicken dance, after the parents have towed their shaky kids like cabooses ready to decouple, and the pint-sized skaters have circled the rink like a gang of meerkats spun into a 10-car pileup, you turn sideways and angle by as another one bites the dust, thumps overhead. You give the DJ a finger point uh, because in your mind, we are soldiers in the march against time, grooving to the retro beat while the disco ball shines overhead, cut crystal against rainbow walls. You glide like Mercury or Apollo Ono without wings or skin suits in low rider jeans that hug your body like you hug corners. Pass them all on the smoothed out parquet floor worn down by time and rhythm. The trick is to make it look effortless. Remind them that your quickness is a kind of love. You are the spark between wood and wheel. And when your cranky kids hang out by the wall ready to go, holding those eight wheels by their brown leather tongues, you give them a wave and keep circling. Just one more song, you say. This is your me time. It's all skate. You've got your whole self in. That's what it's all about. Oh, that's great. Night at the Roller Palace. You didn't know I was going to break out into Queen, did you? <laughs> I figured. I was wondering if you'd sing that line. That was great. Oh, I sing, baby. I sing. <laughs> um, so so one of the things that, that just stands out in this book is that your style of writing is so, um, it both feels um, sort of clear and natural and, and casual, but then really polished at the same time. Um, how do you, like, what do you think about as far as a poem goes? I mean, they're, they're very personal poems for the most part. And mm -hmm. so it's like a personal storytelling type poetry, but then, mm -hmm. you know, you're getting through the poems in a way that's very clear too. Is, is that like, like, what do you look for? Like, what do you want to see in a poem that you've written or that, that someone else has written? I want to feel something. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I, I don't want to give away the store. You know, I love mystery and I love surprise. And I think that's where enjambment and line breaks happen. Um, a great turn of phrase. Um, but I want you to understand it. And, you know, I like poems that obscure meaning and make you work for it. But mm -hmm. I want to connect with my reader. You know, I, and honestly, when I write a poem, I write it for myself. So I think I write the type of poems I want to read, which might sound a little... I don't know, off, but, but, you know, I, I, I think I'm my first best audience. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a tough question to answer, you know, when you have to think about your style and process. Um, but I, I try to be, I try to be clear and interesting, I guess, but, you know, but, but I, but I, but I want you to feel something. I mean, I, you know, and if I'm putting it down on the page, you know, it's got to, I have this little test. It's the, um, so what test, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So if you're written a poem and you get to the end and you're like, eh, you know, like something's missing. I mean, well, maybe I didn't decide, you know, maybe I haven't decided the ending. Maybe, you know, maybe something's not working towards the end, but I always come back to like, what am I risking in this poem? Mm -hmm. You know, what's at stake here? Mm -hmm. You know, so I do, you know, you know, I, I do talk a lot about family issues. I mean, I talk about, you know, my life and, you know, but I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I wouldn't reveal anything that, you know, <laughs> I still hold back a lot. You know, I wouldn't re reveal anything that would embarrass people or, or myself necessarily, but, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I just love that. So what question? And if people who watch our critique of the week every Friday will know that that's one of the things I write at the bottom of poems very often. Like we get to the end. <laughs> that happens so much reading submissions, though. Like you're reading and it's like great line, great line. It's interesting. I'm engaged. And then you get to the end and like nothing happened. And I didn't you know, we didn't right. move anywhere from one thing to another and no, nothing like we didn't learn anything or we didn't have no. anything at stake. We kind of just like painted a picture. Right. And, and, you so, know, I yeah. realized I realize when I get to the point in the poem where I'm asking, so what, and I really can't answer it, then maybe I'm trying to get to a new level or a new phase. I mean, maybe that's sort of the end of something and the start of something else. So I really do pay attention to that, you know, and again, I don't want to put stuff out that's, that's okay, or I've done it before or feels typical or, you know, 
yeah, I'd like to, th I'd like to grow with my poetry and that's not easy to do. So uh, I'm always looking for things to, to challenge, to challenge me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Great answer. Um, and let's do another poem. Okay. Um, I am trying to remember what I said I would do. Okay. Uh, how about hoodie? I'll read this. So we just, um, uh, it just sent my, my, my 18 year old son to college he's at Syracuse University now and so I'm still getting over that but uh this is a poem for my son hoodie a gray hoodie will not protect my son from rain from the New England cold I see the partial eclipse of his face as his head sinks into the half dark and shades his eyes even on our quiet suburb with its unlocked doors, I fear for his safety. The darkest child on our street in the empire of blocks. Sometimes I do not know who he is anymore, traveling the back roads between boy and man. He strides a deep stride, pounds a basketball into wet pavement. Will he take his shot or is he waiting for the open mouth orange rim to take a chance on him. I sing his name to the night, ask for safe passage from this borrowed body into the next and wonder who could mistake him for anything but good. Yeah, great poem, great last line too. Um, um, and, and people are loving these poems. Uh, Mariel Class says, I'm feeling you. And Cindy P um, Gunthermann <laughs> says these poems are so memorable, which they are. I mean, they're, they're so... Um, they're so just, just well, well crafted, really. Um, and like, I love that line, um, traveling the back roads between boy and man. Like, what a great way to put that. Um, is that as a line like that something that comes out spontaneously as you're writing, or is that something that like I need some more kick there? I'm gonna get a good right. metaphor in at that point in the poem. I I think that particular line uh, came out pretty close to that, mm -hmm. so I didn't have to look for another way to say. You know, I was thinking about, well, how can I say that Alex is, you know, he's 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 in that in-between teen stage, you know. So, um, you know, I think about like that last line. That last line I always think is an abrupt line. It fits. It's the right line. But I read it all the time and think, should that line be longer or, you know, or it should be different. And I, you know, so even after it's published, I still go back and forth. And, yeah. You know is this the way it should be? I yeah. Well, I is. think definitely so. It's that, it's the, it's the short punch of it that like gives it the punch. Like it's sort of like it, it hits you before you realize what was hitting you. You know, I think it, it works perfectly like that. So that yeah. instinct to yeah. go, go with that short line there and end yeah. abruptly, I think is a perfect one because that, that really stores a lot within the poem. Yeah. Um, you mentioned teaching undergraduates. Um, how do you find that? Do you teach creative writing or do you teach other things? And, and, and how do you go about teaching poetry to people? Like, what do you find is the most, the best advice you give students and, and that, that helps them the most? Um, I, right now I'm teaching two creative writing classes and I'm attempting to teach a nature writing class, mm. which is, you know, I'm, I'm not an environmentalist. Um, and I really wanted to try this. Maybe it was from all the bird feeders, but I, you know, I really did like, it, because it, nature requires a certain level of attention. And that has uh, something that I've noticed that's changed in my own work really since rewilding. Um, so when I teach undergrads, I mean, they're a little all over the place. And I, you know, honestly, since now I have an undergraduate, you know, in college, I, I have a different perspective. So I think I'm a little more, I hope to be a little more compassionate with my students. <laughs> um, you know, I try to, the best I can ask for, I think when I teach creative writing, cause I'll teach fiction also is there, you know, students are usually more comfortable with fish, fiction. They've written short stories and, you know, probably had some success and enjoyed it. Read some stories that they've liked. Um, poetry is a tougher sell. Um, so I want to, make them comfortable with the with the idea of the everyday that poetry doesn't have to be about the huge lofty ideas you know there it poetry can be is really about the everyday mm -hmm. and um you know it, it doesn't require you know um you know five you know five syllable words every line i mean you really do uh listen to rhythm and pacing and um that they can do this and at the very least 
when they when we finish the poetry section, it should be, you know, a little bit easier for them to appreciate poetry. They may not love it, but they may not recoil it. You know, after you know somebody says, "Oh yeah, you know, I like poetry." You know, <laughs> you know, just a nod of approval is okay because they get it. It's not it's not some lofty thing that you know, you have to have a PhD for, mm -hmm. you know, it's for everybody. And then I remind them where they can find poetry, you know, it's everywhere. It's, you know, it's in, mm -hmm. it's in music and rap songs. It's in, you know, advertising these days, it's everywhere, which, you know, is, is kind of a good thing. It's also where, um, you know, when we go to, to, to find, to, to answer the difficult questions that you really can't get in everyday speech. So, why do you think they, they have that impression? Like, why do you think it's a tougher sell than other things? Like, it, I never understood that to, to, I don't know. I don't know how, why it, it comes out that way. Why do you think? You know, I mean, I, I guess I'll speak from my high school experience. And a lot of times I couldn't relate. I mean, I, I, I really do enjoy Shakespeare's sonnets, but, um, uh, you know, it, it didn't speak to me in the language um, that I, I could relate to. But I understand what it means to walk down the street, for instance, and wonder, you know, am I going to be walking? Am I going to be OK walking down a dark street? Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, if my father would come home from a hard day at work. You know, I, I understand that that anguish and grief. I mean, like not to say that poetry of a certain generation did not address those issues. I really want things that talked about references and and things that I got. I mean, at least that gives me a starting point mm -hmm. in language, and then we can sort of build around that. So, I mean, I, I, I've I, always wanted poetry to be, you know, accessible gets a bad rap, but, you know, I want people to, to, you know, find my work and then go find someone else's and then, you know, go back a generation and then go back even further. So if I'm a entry point or a gateway drug to more poetry <laughs> i'll take it yeah I'll well that's right. well you know we love accessible around here that's one of our favorite yeah. words because I, th I think poetry <laughs> should be you know i mean it should be for yeah. everybody not right. not just phds absolutely um, um well we have three more poems you wanted to read let's uh let's do the next one okay all right so this doesn't happen to me so often remember i live in new england i live you know in massachusetts so it's not the most diverse of places but occasionally uh, people have told me that I resemble um, our former first lady from a few years ago, mm -hmm. not the last first lady. Um, I'm being told I look like Flotus, New Year's Eve party 2014. Deep in my biceps, I know it's a compliment, just as I know this is an all black people look alike moment. So I use the minimal amount of muscles to crack a smile. All night he catches sight of me or someone like me standing next to deconstructed cannoli and empty bottles of Prosecco. And in that moment, I understand how little right any of us have to be whoever we are. The constant tension of making our way in this world on hope and change. You're working your muscles to the point of failure, Michelle Obama once said about her workout regimen. But she knows we wear our history in our darkness, in our patience. A compliment is a compliment, this I know, just as the clock will always strike midnight and history repeats. This is how I can wake up the next morning and love the world again. Yeah, that's a great poem with a quick, you know, a sh transitioning kind of last line. Um, and, and I love, I don't know, maybe I'm in like too much of a, a critiquing um, mood right now or, or lately, but I love some of the little, little turns like that or someone like me in that fourth line, like how much that little little aside adds to the, to the, the poem, you know? Um, mm -hmm. um, so what do you do? Like what is your response to a comment like that, knowing that, <laughs> you know, seeing both sides of it as you do so clearly in this poem? You know, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's about race and race is not a topic I shy away from. And, you know, I can carry my story into a poem and play around with it and fool with it. And I honestly, for that poem, I felt like every line needed to be interesting. So I couldn't have anything that felt flat. Mm -hmm. So I was really looking to carry that forward. 
that is a poem I remember building. Sometimes it feels like construction work, putting a poem together and other times it just flows. That one was one I, I felt like I had to, you know, it's like, you know, building with blocks, just, you know, layer after layer. Mm -hmm. So, um, but poems, you know, give me a way of working through some of those situations. And, you know, it, it gives me an opportunity to talk about, yeah, you know, there is this double consciousness that happens when you, you know, when you're a person of color or if you feel like an other. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, I think all of us have had the experience of being an ex in a room full of O's. Yeah. And so I think that's kind of the core of the poem, but I would be remiss if I didn't say, you know, yeah, it's about, you know, that whole idea that, you know, we're not all alike, you know, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. yeah, yeah, well, great poem. I mean, just great poems throughout. Um, one thing I want to talk about before I forget is your all the work you've done with the Massachusetts Poetry Festival, because that is mm -hmm. such a, it seems like such rewarding work. It must be but exhausting, though. I mean, what I is it like to, to put through a festival like that? And, and how, I don't know, can you explain about what, what your role has been in that? Mm -hmm. So I stepped away in 2018, and that was probably, uh, yeah, a, a little bit before I went off to Mississippi for a fellowship. But, uh, you know, six years with the festival and, you know, even, you know, sometime before that. So I've really been with Mass Poetry around 10 years. Um, you know, what a great thing to to put people together and talk about poetry. And I always said with the uh, Mass Poetry Festival, who is, uh, it's now in the ably capable hands of MP Carver, so masspoetry.org, mm -hmm. and the next festival will be next year. Um, it's it for me. It was always like if AWP and the Dodge Festival had a baby, this would be <laughs> our, our festival. Uh -huh. So you know, as you know, as an organizer, you know, as somebody who puts on you know things weekly, it takes a lot of work to make something look seamless, <laughs> and so it's a volunteer effort mm -hmm. and. The people who are involved with it love it and have come back and volunteered every year. And yeah, it's a lot of work that just doesn't get seen. Yeah. Um, and then you forget about it. <laughs> you know, the, the, the event happens and then you forget all of that. And then you're just, you're seeing the fruits of the labor. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just putting people together who want to talk about poetry who want to listen to poetry who want to share their ideas and their theories around poetry or they just want to get up and be on an open mic i mean you know i wish we could do it like every month you know i i all praise to any local you know regional poetry uh events and happenings especially during this time because we're just starting to get back to the in-person mm -hmm. uh activity so you know, I'm glad I did not have to do it during COVID. I'm yeah. glad I didn't have to put it online. Mass Poetry did, and they did an excellent job. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and I look forward to it coming back in Salem next year. Is it coming back live? Yeah, it's hard. It, I don't know. I'm a little, to be honest, getting worried that people aren't going to come back in the same way they used to. Like, we've had some events, um, you know, and people, it, it seems harder to generate a crowd than it's had, which for understandable reasons, people are, mm -hmm. are worried about, you know, what they might catch and all that stuff. But um, but I don't know. I wonder too if people have sort of gotten used to being in their own little place and not going out to things like that. Well, I I don't know. So I think you know we're locally uh, we're trying to put together a reading, and so we're going to test that theory. Mm -hmm. And it's not the festival; it's just you know something that our local group of writers is going to do, the Thursday poet. So we're going to test the wires and see, but you know, I've been to a few readings, uh, you know, over the past two, three months, you know, I think we've masked up everywhere we've gone for the readings and the speaker was unmasked and they've been well attended. You know, part of me is sort of tired of zoom. Uh, we're going to Salem States bringing in uh, Naomi Shihab Nye in a few weeks. And we're thrilled about that. I mean, like that's an in-person event. So, um, you know, I, I think, I, I think it's trial and error. I think every every place in the country is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth trying and seeing what mix works, you know? I do. I but but I think if you want to do something large, I mean you might have to scale it back a bit, but I, I definitely think I think people want to get back to in person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was my impression or my hope or, or my right. suspicion, I guess I could say. I thought people would be like rearing to go getting back and in person events after being cooped up for so long. 
Um, yeah. You mentioned Salem State, and earlier Joe Barca asked um, how you ended up at Salem State. Hmm. So um, when the festival, uh, so the Mass Poetry Festival started in 2008. So it was in Lowell, Massachusetts for two years. And Michael and Sarah, who was the co-founder, um, you know, was working with the city of Lowell. And then, you know, people changed uh, positions in Lowell. So it was a little bit harder to get uh, resources. And so uh, we had the opportunity to bring it to Salem. And I volunteered in 2011 and really wanted to be festival director, but I couldn't do it without, I mean, cause it was still mostly volunteer, but I, you know, I was working at another college that was a, a heck of a commute away from my house. It was just too much. So Salem State made a space for the festival and me. So I, mm-hmm. I, that's when I started teaching. I didn't have teaching in my life plan, oh, really? but it, you know, no, I, you know, I did, I did not think I would be a teacher, although I didn't know exactly what I would do anyway. I was, I actually, I was a, um, an editor. I was a senior editor at Babson college. So I was in the, uh, I was, uh, I was in the administrative side. So I just figured I'd probably be an administrator at some point, but the festival came along and it was just the right time. And Salem state is 18, 13 minutes from my house, Mm -hmm. 18 minutes during Halloween. So, um, you know, I'm really grateful to some very, very smart, kind people who uh, saw the value of the festival and uh, made a home for me as well. So that's, I mean, you know, I'm just grateful. Yeah, that's really cool. And how do you, do you like love teaching? Do you find that that's something that you especially like? I like teaching a whole lot. I will admit I like writing more. Yeah. I, <laughs> I I love working with my students. Uh, I grading is, you know, draining, (laughs) (laughs) but no, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I, I, I'm curious to see, you know, what happens with this nature writing class and, you know, maybe some new courses that I can bring forward in the next few years. So I like the ability to sort of change what I teach. Mm -hmm. Um, And I like to, you know, connect with my students and, you know, I've had a few go on and like, you know, they're starting to publish now that's pretty exciting, you know? I never thought I would see myself in that position. So yeah, you know. yeah, that little incubator with ripples going out for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we have two poems left to read. Do you want to read uh, the next one? Sure. So I'm going to read because uh, it's a fun one. First sex after divorce. I'm eating an empire after cursing the tree, the crunch, the tear, the juice streaming from the corners when there's too much in my mouth where to put the tongue and how to make it last. The tart perfume, the beautiful stem, the small seeds, freeing the peel from the skin and the dissolve into pulp. The next bite, then the next. Eve knew what she wanted long before it had a name. The curved structure, the mounded flesh, a grove within a grove, an orchard, red and hot, praise the tree from which it fell and the gravity that brought it down, praise what remains, praise Newton's third law of motion, praise the physics of cupping my hands around the fruit, praise the fruit itself, praise the doctors who prescribe it daily, praise hunger, praise sweet want, the feast of flesh and the hard cider. Yeah, very fun poem. First sex after divorce. Um, some humor in there too, which is, is sprinkled throughout this book um, as well. Um, yeah. yeah, great stuff. Um, so, so what? Before we read the last poem, what do you have? Um, you know, on tap next. You, you know, you write regularly, and this book is now four years old. So, how do you know when you have a book, a collection of poems that's a collection? Are you always like looking at your own work and seeing what you have and how it might fit together, or do you have a plan? Um, how, what's your next book going to be, do you think? So for the, for the first three books, you know, I would just write and then, you know, I sort of had 60 poems and I whittled them down to 50 and sent them to the publisher and they whittled them down some more. And that's how I knew I had a book for this one. I, you know, I really did assemble it. So when I, I went to, um, 
Mississippi on fellowship at the University of Mississippi in Oxford, Mississippi. And um, I started to learn really about the, you know, in just a new and uh, compelling way, the legacy of slavery and um, the legacy of Emmett Till. And I was, I was changed by that. So um, I did a lot of research during that time and I started to write around it. And I went down in 2019 for the academic year. So 2020 came along and COVID hit. So I had about seven months there. And then the last two, that's really when I start writing these poems. Um, and so towards the end of the year, I think I had a manuscript um, and I started to, you know, fool with it and just, um, you know, try to, how, how do I talk about this Emmett Till story? And also, you know, sort of the continuation of what I'm doing in Rewilding. Mm -hmm. So the result of that is a manuscript called Glitter Road. And I am sort of almost ready to talk about it, but not there yet. But, um, you know, a lot of the more recent poems, like the one that appears in Rattle, mm -hmm. uh, is out of that manuscript. So um, I'm, I'm excited about it. I mean, I really do think it's some of my best work. I do think that about every book I put out, but you know, it, it feels different to me and it, it feels important in a different way, you know, uh, talking about the legacy of Emmett Till, how we're still seeing this through line, mm -hmm. you know, from 1955 to now and, you know, to George Floyd and Dante Wright and, you know, many other um, black bodies who, you know, um, have we lost too soon. Mm -hmm. So um, and to talk about being a woman at a certain point in her life. I mean, it, it, for me, it's a complicated story, but but the joy of it is trying to find that narrative and put it all together. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're all really excited for it too, I'm sure. And that's a perfect segue to the last poem here because this is the mm -hmm. poem from uh, Poetry Magazine um, yes. from this book. So um, why don't you go ahead and share that? Yes, I will. Um, so when I was in... Uh, uh, Mississippi, like right before I came down, uh, some boys from Old Miss had vandalized uh, the marker for um, Emmett Till, uh, where he was pulled out of the water of the Tallahatchie. So for those who don't know, Emmett Till was a 14-year-old boy who was beaten, shot, um, you know, uh, had a 75-pound cotton gin fan wrapped around his neck, thrown into the Tallahatchie, all because he reportedly, you know, uh, whistled at a white woman in you know, 14, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, some old Miss students had uh, vandalized the sign and that happened before we came down. So I was able to go to the rededication um, of that sign, but it really sort of, you know, the story is still, you know, present with me and, um, so I wrote this poem and I was, you know, it, it's one of many that's in the manuscript. So the title comes from a U.S. News Today article. Uh, three white Old Miss students use guns to vandalize a memorial to lynching victim Emmett Till. They pose their bodies as if they've just bagged their first 10 point buck. One holds a shotgun, another squats below the shot, up, the shot up sign, a third stands with an AR-15. Three faces smiling, hoisting guns in front of a bullet-ridden marker. This is the site where Till's body was removed from the river. It is hunter's hours. The sign's jagged holes could slice a finger. Those students are someone's sons or brothers not much older than the young black boy, his body beaten, tethered to a 75 pound cotton gin fan and thrown into the Tallahatchie. This is an old story, a Southern Gothic. To deny the boys, to deny this boy's life and then deny the marker that says he lived breaks me every time. The camera captures the night's dark cover, the tall grasses, the momentary flash illuminating their shit-eating grins and the gun barrels glint. Lifetimes of getting away with it. 
Yeah. Another, another great last line, uh, which you seem to come up with. Let me ask you just one more question before you go. How do you come up with those last lines? Are you looking for a certain note or a certain way to go about doing it? Or how do you know when you've hit on the last line that's, that's right? Um, I don't. I mean, I think it's a feeling. Mm -hmm. I mean, it needs to feel finished. It needs to feel complete. And a lot of times if I don't get there, it probably means I haven't decided how I wanted the poem to end. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. Sometimes, um, you know, um, I have to go up, you know, and maybe I've, maybe the poem ended like two, three lines before. So maybe I'll go back and, and cut something out, mm -hmm. or maybe it just needs to be reworked. And that's where revision comes in, which I'm not, revisions a necessary evil, you know, I'll do it, but, you know, <laughs> but it's not like the joy for me is the creation, but the work happens in revision. Mm -hmm. So. I, it, you know, it, it takes a little bit to get to a satisfying ending. And then I feel like the poem has to earn that ending. So you can't just slap a line on there and say, well, you know, you got to really kind of work for it. Yeah. Well, I love that you say that about revision because I feel the same way. And um, but a lot of people come on and they say, oh, revising is the most magical part of the whole experience. And, <laughs> and I say, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's not me. But um, yeah, but it's been wonderful. I mean, just great poems. We're all looking forward to this uh, book coming up. That was um, uh, the last poem was from uh, Poetry's May 2021 issue. Um, but Jen, thanks so much for being a guest and sharing your work with us, and, and great discussion too. It's been a pleasure. Oh well, thank you, Tim. It's it's good to see you. It's good yeah. to see you. Yeah, thank great you. to see you too. Take care. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that was uh, January Gill O'Neill. You can find uh, more of Jen's web work um, at her website. All three of the books. The website is January gilloneal.com january gilloneal.com so find it there um all the books all from uh, kevin carey press as we talked about um and so um yeah pick up a copy of, of this book and the other two now we're gonna take a quick break and go to the open lines as always um the open lines you can share whatever you would like um you can share poems about current events you can share poems uh for the prompt from last week uh, you can share poems about um um uh, that were published recently, especially if you have a link to, to where it was published, then we can share that, which is always fun. So um, first thing you do, though, is email to open mic. That's open M-I-C at rattle.com. Find the Zoom link in the chat windows, which I'm deploying right here, and you can jump over to this Zoom. And um, I will be back in just a moment with the uh, open lines. So see you, hang tight, and I'll see you in just a bit. And we're back. Thanks so much for your patience. I got to get rid of this uh, this uh, other camera microphone thing. I keep clicking on the wrong button. Um, um, anyway, um, today's the prompt for this week was to let me look it up because I don't actually remember off the top of my head. The prompt for this week was to craft a poem 
uh, craft a poem that connects a folk tale, Bible story, fairy tale, mythology, etc., and gives us a new perspective, turning it on its head. That was your uh, prompt for this week. And my poem is a kind of, um, um, I would say it's a, it's a long, it's, it's, a, it's a poem. It, it was spun off from um, the story of the um, Iron Bulls. Um, that they used to have as a torture device. I'm, I'm not sure if that's actually real. It might just be an urban legend. Um, but then also, um, it's sort of, I find myself kind of trying to write like um, um song, that wonderful Bridget Pigeon Kelly type. So this is what the style I was going for and the spinoff I was going for. This is, uh, and it's kind of a long, longer poem than I usually do. So sorry for the long read, but here is this week's poem. This is The Cast Iron Pig. And we also have a poem from Megan coming up next, too. So so uh, a lot of, uh, lot of fun stuff here. The Cast Iron Pig. There once was an ocean that met the sea through a narrow channel. On that sea was an island, and on that island a town. The town had a church, and the church had a steeple. The steeple was a, sp- a spire, and at that very top, as though spiked through the gut, hung a life-size cast iron pig. This made as little sense to the townsfolk as it does to you, dear reader. The church was old. The cast iron pig looked older. Oh, hang on a second. Got to mute that. Go mute that. Sorry. Um, yeah. So everybody keep yourself muted until it's your turn. Okay. Anyway, not even the very old woman tending the lighthouse could recall who had hung it there or why, because the island lacked enough flat land for a field. The popular sport had become to ponder the pig, which could be seen from any point on the island, and indeed for quite a ways out to sea. Fishermen pondered the pig as they hauled up their nets. Hikers pondered the pig from hills. Hunters pondered while tracking what little game they could find, mostly birds from the mainland who, legends told, may themselves have been come to ponder the pig. Even the very old woman pondered the pig as she climbed the hundred hazardous steps of the lighthouse. Most afternoons, two middle-aged gentlemen met at a cafe to ponder the pig together. They drank deep drafts of the tea for which the island was famous, and lingered, happy to share at length their daily musings. As can be expected, after a certain time they came to a quarrel. The slightly older gentleman began thinking the pig a great gift, the very thing that made life on the island unique. To the younger gentleman, though, the pig was a blight, a nonsensical embarrassment that brought to the island a modest, though not insubstantial, shame. Of course, there wasn't need for a cross at the top of the steeple because the islanders no longer believed. A weather vane, too, would be artifice, as the weather was always the same, a steady wind from the east, fog in the morning, thunder in late afternoons. On these points, the gentlemen could still agree, but the fact remained. One thought the pig a blessing, the other a curse. As the arguments continued, each only grew stronger in his conviction. The The firmer one belief, the farther the other could push against it. They drank less and less of their famous tea. The weeks progressed, and the younger gentlemen moved to making proclamations. Not only was the cast-iron pig a scourge upon the island, but something must be done to remove it. Meanwhile, the slightly older gentleman had fashioned a looking-glass for the sole purpose of admiring the cast-iron pig in finer detail. Not only was the pig's presence a generous mystery in a world in which so much was known, but it was also a masterful work of craftsmanship. He came to spending his afternoons in silence, gazing up at the pig as other gentlemen raved. At some point, the slightly older man must have stopped listening, because he was surprised to see his former companion appear inside the looking-glass, leaning out the steeple's uppermost window a great distance from the ground. The younger man shimmied off the ledge and up onto the roof, a large hammer hanging from a loop in his belt. His intentions were clear. The older man would have moved to stop the other, but he knew there wasn't time. The steeple was too far even to shout, so he watched through his glass as the younger man beat at the belly of the pig, a late afternoon thunderhead swirling behind him. You know the rest. The slightly older gentleman, who had nothing left to ponder, drank his daily tea alone and died too many years later. And the lesson, every man shakes hands with a sea. So that is the cast iron pig. Sorry for the length, that was probably the longest poem I've read in a while anyway. But I didn't know what else to do. I was had, had trouble with this prompt, to be honest. And this is uh, Megan's great poem. This is a, about the uh, Jungle Book. And this is a retelling of Mowgli, or Mowgli. I don't know how you say it. I think it's Mowgli. Uh, so here is Megan's prompt poem for this week. Mowgli. Oops. There we go. Mowgli. In another life, she keeps the baby. Someone gives her a cradle. 
Her man stays, brings home steady paychecks, wilted lilies. She trains the boy in her heart not to stray, not to go where the trees are dense and dark. An unseen line separates wild and tamed. The boy wonders which he is. You are marked, his mother insists, for greatness, a claim he finds hard to believe. He can't keep still. His mind, in his mind, spelling words scatter like crows. Sometimes he sneaks out at night, climbs the hill behind the house. Under the moon, his toes inch past the invisible line that keeps the beasts that wake from the children who sleep. That was Megan's poem, a sonnet, with really hidden rhymes there. Uh, that was Mowgli, Megan's poem for the week. Now let's see what everybody else has. And we have a whole bunch of people lined up. I think we probably, let's see, I think we should stick to a one poem limit for today. Um, we have nine people, and then some people come in later too, 10 already. So let's do, uh, let's keep it to one poem, and let's go first to the first man of the hour on board, which is Dick Westheimer. Hey, Dick, hey, how you doing? Good. That story, that story, that yarn that you, uh, <laughs> that you unraveled there and then knitted back together at the end, that was something... That was a um, weird one. Yeah, I started it a long time ago, and then and then f finished it and changed it today. So that was that was fun I, to work through. I did start a prompt poem. It would start off with uh, Cain and Abel reading Bible verses to each other, but I never finished it. That's so funny because I uh, that's what I was trying to do. I thought for some reason I was going to do a Cain and Abel, and then yeah. um and then I couldn't figure out what to do with it, twisting it, you know. So I'm curious to see where you would have went with it. Yeah. Well. It'll come back some someday. I'm still working on it. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. So, what do you want to share though? Um, so, um, I sent you to I sent you a little haiku and then a short, but I'll read a short history of the birth of stars. Okay, you could do the haiku too. It's only a haiku. I mean, come on. <laughs> okay. Okay. But hi, I'll do the haiku first. Okay, here's the haiku then. Uh, this this was all I could muster for royal for the royals. The death of a queen in autumn leaves fall. Oh, that the was death yours. Of a yeah. Queen in autumn leaves fall. Yeah, the death of a queen in autumn leaves fall. Sorry for interrupting you with a double. Um, <laughs> That's okay. But uh, but yeah yeah I like that a lot. That's a really great haiku. Yeah, it was one I, of the I, ones I was thinking about for this week. It happened. It happened very very quickly. Um, and my 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 affinity for the royals is. <laughs> <laughs> zero but i understand that there are people for mm -hmm. whom it's a religion so i don't aim to offend them yeah yeah exactly um and then a short history of the birth of stars is the other one so yeah. you want to explain that uh sure so this is another one of my james webb image uh inspired and this was of a um Oh, gosh, uh, this was an image in the tarantula galaxy that came out last week of a um, star nursery that really was suspected to be a star nursery, but before they could penetrate it with, um, um, you know, the infrared vision of it, uh, it, it wasn't clear how many stars were there, and there were millions and mm -hmm. millions, and so this is um, a little funny story, a short history of the birth of stars. In bed tonight, my wife asks me about the news, what story I'm excited by today. And while I'm not sure if this is talk therapy or foreplay, I tell her that the James Webb Space Telescope captured an image of a galactic cloud not so far away. 160 years as the crow flies, I add, and she laughs at my joke, knows crows can't fly in space, so maybe this is foreplay. And I tell her it's a stellar nursery, a place where millions of baby stars burn their ways into being, and she stirs at the word nursery, and I think, now we're really getting somewhere. And I tell her about the shroud of cosmic dust between us and those stars. When other telescopes like Hubble look in their direction, none can see through. And she kind of sighs, sad that something so beautiful could be victim of galactic haze. And I'm thinking, maybe talk of smog space dims her ardor. So I add that the dust is the remains of older stars 
and it feeds the birthing ones, like rotting flora and flesh feeds the soil we grow food in. And I can tell she feels curiously aroused by this cosmic circle of life. So hands and bodies follow, find their way as we move through dilated time, fall into each other's curved space. And when we emerge whole and have she a nova, me a darker star, she lets loose like in the movies when a sated lover cries out an ex's name, Webb, oh, definitely James Webb, which made me feel a like a Nova too. And that's our little astronomy lesson for today. Oh, that was wonderful. Very fun poem, Dick. Thanks so much for sharing that. I was trying not to laugh in some parts <laughs> of it and interrupt your flow there. Um, yeah, great stuff. Okay, thanks, Jim. Yeah, Have always a, a pleasure. Week. Yeah, take care, Dick. It was uh, Richard Westheimer with uh, A Short History of the Birth of Stars. And let's go next. We're just going to go in the order they are on my screen. And next up is um, um, a Mary Ann Abdo. Hi, how are you? Good. How are you doing, Mary Ann? Good. So this is longer than usual. Okay. Um, that's why I sent one poem this week. And it's a twist on Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Excellent. Okay. And um, let me try to find it. Um, I did a little revision this afternoon. Okay. Is it, uh, is it something you submitted or is it something? I on... submitted it um, through um, for for the, Rattlecat. The open mic email? The open mic email, yeah. Hmm. It was like late last night. Okay. Late last night. Oh, there, there it is. Okay. I found it. Okay, because the, the, the name doesn't match up, but that's fine. Okay, no need for redemption. That's the right one, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. So no need for redemption. Introduction. Ebenezer Scrooge was a kindly old soul who gave to the poor houses every 25th of the month. His generosity was known from Camden Town to the center of the Queen's Court. Ever the astute and wealthy businessman poring over the accountant books, paying his clock handsome wages for services rendered, and he made his endeavor that all merchants were treated fairly, for all merchants highly respected Ebenezer, greeting him with warm adulation, deeply saddened by his saintly partner, Mr. Jacob Marley's passing these seven Christmases ago. Old Mr. Scrooge eagerly set up a children's charity in Marley's honor, with great, which greatly helped Bob Cratchit's son, Tiny, Tiny Tim, from a dreadful fate. Because of the endowment, Tiny Tim was enabled with good health and a blessed life. Blessings were showered upon Ebenezer since his early childhood, never being sent away to boarding school. He enjoyed the privileges of a loving family life. Along with his sister, Fanny, they have made merriment each and every Christmas holiday with family and friends galore. Part one. One Christmas Eve, while Ebenezer's family was dreaming of the next morning's trinkets and treats, Ebenezer stayed in the, the study to ponder the holidays ahead of him. The chimes started blaring loudly in Scrooge's head. A ghostly sight of Marley waltzed through the doorway. Thank ye of the, thanking thee of the good that was done in thy honor. Many happy returns, my dear man Ebenezer. You have done thee proud, bellowed Marley. But wait, I have so much to tell you, my dear Marley, exclaimed Ebenezer. Now, now, Ebenezer. You will be visited by three saintly visions, one at three o'clock, the other at four o'clock, the other at five o'clock, whispered Jacob. Marley left just as he came in, front facing the study room door. Scrooge thought to himself, I wonder to which three it shall be. Part two. The first bell tolled at the time of three o'clock. St. Margaret of Scotland appeared in her finest Ebenezer was stunned to see such beauty before him as they flew through the streets of Camden Town showering all the love showing all the love Ebenezer experienced 
What a fine upbringing. I commend your parents. They showed you that honesty and kindness were the best policies. I greatly admire your qualities as a charitable man, declared St. Margaret. Thank you, my good lady, said Ebenezer. In an instant, when the bell tolled four o'clock, she disappeared. Part three. In the kitchen, Ebenezer could hear the sounds of a monk chanting a Latin hymn and beckoning Ebenezer to step through the Victorian doorway. St. Bede, declared Scrooge. Yes, it is I, your next visitor. Now sit here and listen over a pint of ale to the history of your attributes, my kind sir, said Bede. But why? For I am yet your humble servant, said Ebenezer. Hush, my good man. Your humility and selfless service to the humankind has won favor with God. I don't need to say any more, for my time is longer than most, and yet I have much to attend to, my good man, exclaimed Bede. And with those words, St. Bede left quickly as he came. Scrooge was stunned, sitting in the dark of night, waiting for his next caller. Part four. As the final bell toll rang for five o'clock, a grand statesman came into view. I am your final caller. I am St. Thomas More, said the saint. Oh, my word. I don't know what to say, said Ebenezer. You need not to say much, for I will do the speaking. Ebenezer, you have stole the virtues of a utopian world here on earth. Your generosity has been so pleasing to our Lord that the moment of your passing, St. Peter will open up the pearly white gates without question. For you have been a model citizen on this planet, exclaimed St. Thomas. I am utterly speechless that, the, speechless that the words cannot escape from my lips. I am eternally grateful, said Ebenezer. There, there, my good man. The privilege of witnessing your life has been all mine. You deserve all the goodness you have shown to others, said, said St. Thomas. As the saint left in a hazy mist, Ebenezer cried tears of joy at the fact he created his own good fortune. He paved the way of this life, paving the way for others with success. For his many returns were blessed with the life well lived. That is all we can ever wish on this 25th day of December. Oh, excellent retelling. Mary Ann Abdo. Thanks so much for sharing that, Mary Ann. That was, You're welcome. Uh... Yeah, yeah, that was uh, no need for redemption. Thanks for sharing that. You're welcome. Um, let's go next to um, Leah Mueller. Hi. Hey. Can you hear me okay? I can, yes. Thanks so much for joining us. Are you a first-time caller, I think? Or have you been on before? I am a first I have am a first time caller. Um, I did have the the uh, poem and rattle a little over a year ago about Jeff Bezos. Oh, that's right. That's so, what I'm thinking of. Okay, great. Well, it's great to see you. Where are you yeah. calling from? I'm calling from Bisbee, Arizona. Excellent. Well, I'm so glad and, you could join uh, us. Uh, what do you have that you'd like to share? Well, um, something that I uh, submitted uh, this week uh, to rattle, but was not chosen, but which is okay. And um, and it's uh, of course about the queen, one of many zillions of poems that you, that you received about the queen, no doubt. Um, I have no particular feeling about the monarchy myself, but I've always been fascinated by Queen Elizabeth's hats. So <laughs> yeah. rather than writing a tribute to her, I thought I would write a tribute to her hats. Perfect. Let's hear. And it goes like, and it goes like this: the queen's hats. Everything matches. The powder blue stovepipe crafted from crushed felt with matching tailored suit. The spring green moss or pale pink like the inside of a conch shell. Pressed feather swirls to a point. It's curl, a coy emphasis. The queen must be perfect always. Her jacket sleeves pressed and ready for waving. Wave she does, with focused detachment, her eyes on the spot, just above your shoulder. Ah, but the hat, perched like a glorious bird, its plumage unruffled. Any minute, it could burst into song, but chooses silence 
as the royal caravan rolls past, then disappears. Tomorrow, the queen returns. A different hat shelters her skin from the punishing English sun. Her closet, large as the continent, overflows with thousands of hats, worn once, then confined to dark corner boxes. A royal cannot be seen twice in the same headgear. Fingers and tongues would wag, the proud empire reduced to a commoner's rags. When the queen smiles, her flushed cheeks reflect the encapsulated warmth. She is immortal, her hat sworn to fealty for as long as the kingdom survives. Yeah, that was excellent. The Queen's Hats. Uh, a lot of, of fun lines. Really fun poem there. Thanks so much for sharing that, Leah. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, a definite pleasure. Thanks. Hope you come on again. Oh, I sure will. Great. Thanks. All right. Have take care. Night. Bye. Bye. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, that was Leah Mueller with uh, The Queen's Hats. An excellent poem there. Um, let's go to um, Let's go to Sharon Ferrante next. I think I unmuted. You did. did hey, I... Sharon, how you doing? Hi, Tim. What a great show. January was wonderful. Thank she you. She was, yeah. She really was. Yeah. Um, I did a prompt poem. Excellent. It's really silly. <laughs> There's a lot um, of silliness today. I like it. It's nice. It feels a lighthearted atmosphere going on right now. Well, the, the fairy tale prompt, yeah. You know I wanted to go crazy. <laughs> um, I have three Tonka. I, if they're really Tonka, I don't know. But um, I have three little stories. Okay. And I mixed up the fairy tales. Sounds good. Let's hear it. In my tattered red dress, I dance with a frog. He lures me to a pumpkin patch. An elf steals my shoe. Flying my magic carpet. I reach for a wizard. He disappears. I'm left to tell the story of the poison apple. Why do you tap at my door? I have no stories left. I'm tied up by a wolf who just ate all the king's men. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, definitely. Three wonderful Tonka. I love the, the mix up of those. Thanks for sharing that. Thank, Sharon. thank yeah. you. It was so much fun. Thank you. Yeah, thank thanks you. a lot. Take care. It was Sharon Ferrante with um, Fairy Tale Tonka. Thanks for sharing that, Sharon. Thank you. Um, let's go next to um, um, Jayanthi Rangan. Hey, can you unmute? Are you there? Yeah. Ah, I, hello. Good to see you again. You me. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much for joining well, us. Thank you. Um, I have used the prompt, mm -hmm. and here we go. Okay. It's called Abandoned. At the wall, my mom hugs. Tighter this time. You'll have a better chance at life by yourself. The lines on her face say, be well. She tries to smile. Her matted hair is moist. I walk into the dark and know she's running scared, vacant and spent like leaded fuel, heavy. A stray pup wags his tail, the only thing a forsaken one can do. Hansel and Gretel had made a trail of breadcrumbs. If my mama had those morsels, if our bellies weren't bawling, the slotted metal bars of the wall would remain a structure, a thing to look at, not to be scaled over. Oh, excellent poem. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. A Hansel and Gretel remake and it's interesting it was one of the ones i was thinking about doing too excellent poem thanks so much for sharing that thank you yeah yeah take care you too yeah that was jianthi rangan with um abandoned yeah thanks so much 
Um, next, let's go to um, Carla Schwartz. Hi. Hey, Carla, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. And um, uh, it's uh, beautiful here, and I guess it's going to rain, which is even more beautiful. Oh, that's even better, yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> and um, I have a short poem that I, I mean, I submitted to, but I'm just going to read the one, the first one, which is a short poem, which was first appeared in print, so I don't have a link for you, in at in Ibbotson Street, a journal that has published some of my poems. And um, this one is called uh, Fairy Tale While Balancing. Excellent. Go ahead. The witch steps in dressed as the Snow Queen. Only she is a man who wants to break my mirror. His hair long as Rapunzel's, tress, Rapunzel's tresses. He trips over himself while I tip forward, my weighted arms counterbalanced by my foot at the end of my leg, except the leg is not as straight as the threads in his loom. As I reach and reach, he weaves short kicks that cannot be freed. I wish I were a perpetual drinking bird. When he cracks owls about my glutes or tries to play them like pan, I fancy wisdom, but the man is no God. He is weak and contentious. As I tether my balance, he falls down. Down he goes until all that remains is frown. Yeah, excellent. That fairy tale while balancing. Thanks so much for sharing that, Carla. Great poem. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Have a great night. Always a pleasure. Take care. Yeah. That's Carla Shorts. Um, mm -hmm. Next, we will go to Mike Bales. Uh, good show tonight. I yeah. always say that the poets on Rattlecast are my continuing education and poetry. Excellent. Thank you. I'm glad you feel that way. Um, I just I emailed it to you just for the prompt. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of say the story of the Garden of Eden is just kind of saying we're Im imperfect. And I think there are other kind of spins on it. Um, basically, at the Quad Cities, I've had some close encounters with deer and uh -huh. this is kind of what the poem's about it's called reflections of eden deer at my window brown fur on antlers yet to be shed it looks at me with its big brown eyes as they wash dishes we're separated by a window pane a cover of darkness of a summer night a wooded ravine half a block away cuts through this town of broken streets recollections Another story told and told again of degrees of separation from nature spreads across the land. And the deer grazes on plants as they poke through the neighbor's fence on a land once held sacred. Our domain, now sectioned and quartered, lies under a starless sky. And I once knew a town named Eden, Eden Valley, Minnesota, a town in the midst of fields and glistening lakes, resorts and greenery, Scenery once seen on a country drive now lingers in the perfection of my dreams. Excellent. Love that ending, especially, Mike. Thanks for sharing that. Reflections okay. of Eden. Yeah, yeah. Take care. Okay, Always thanks. a pleasure. Yeah. All right, bye. Um, next up is Brent Stauffer. Hey, Tim. Hey, Brent. How are you doing tonight? Oh, doing good. <laughs> we got uh, a cat no. cameo. <laughs> yeah, the cat wants to get involved. Nice. Does the cat I, I any poems? Uh, I think... She's jealous of Jennifer's cat getting all the attention. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, it's been a great night, as always. Yeah, definitely. It I always really is. Enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. So what do you have you would like to share? Okay, well, I sent you two, two of them. Uh, they're both pretty short. Yeah, they are um, short. Why don't we just read two? Uh, the, there's, uh, there's time. One is really short. Yeah, it is. Um, I see. I check them before I <laughs> And neither one of them are, are like uh, um, really good, so I, I figure two mediocre poems might equal one good poem. Uh, that's a good good that. idea, yeah. <laughs> so uh, so which one let's do the Hunger Stones first because okay. it's it's not as good, I don't think, as the other one. But anyway, <laughs> um, 
it's it's an old um, it's an old poets respond mm-hmm. poem. You might remember um, uh, Dick wrote and read one about mm-hmm. these hunger stones too. Yeah, um, I, I think everybody remembers what that. Yeah, there are a few that week because it's such a poetic. Just the name is yeah. so poetic. Yeah. Yeah, it and, just begs for. Yeah, and for people who don't know, I just say this is uh, with the droughts. There are these stones that were carved during droughts during the medieval times, hundreds of years ago, and they say things like, um, um, "If you read this, weep" or something like that, because they, um, yeah. you know, if the if the water levels are that low, you're in trouble with, with the harvest. Yeah. Uh, it's basically <laughs> the gist, and and now with the drought, they're being revealed again for the first time in in many many years. Yeah. 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 Oh, and other stuff is getting revealed too, like Nazi boats oh, and really? stuff that yeah. have been sunk for for however long that's been. Yeah, I thought Lake Powell has a boat hand. So there's like a couple boats like <laughs> no wow. that buried. Oh, and also in yeah. Lake Mead uh-huh. out there by Las Vegas, they keep finding bodies all the time. Oh yeah, that's where Jimmy Hoffa. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's what could okay. be what might find him next. <laughs> all right, so hunger stones goes like. Um, the river Elba shies away from the sun's endless stare. She sinks into herself, lost to her own past. The exposed rock reveals a 17th century sprawl. If you read this, then weep. The hunger stone is a warning. This poem is a hunger stone. Ah, oh, interesting. This poem is a hunger stone. Thanks for sharing that, Brent. Thanks. Hey. And then the other and then one. the other one is a prompt poem from this week, mm-hmm. um, and um, it's the the Minotaur from Theseus and the Minotaur, except from his point of view. Mm-hmm. Okay, and um, I think it'd be good to remember in terms of understanding the fourth stanza that um, his dad was a bull that was a gift from Poseidon Hmm. to the queen. And in some versions of this myth, him and Theseus are actually half brothers. So, yeah. So, Monitor. Sometimes I think I see a way out. Sometimes it seems daylight lies just around the corner, but it's always just another torch sputtering to itself. This maze is always changing. This maze never wants me or anyone else to leave. So don't try to find me. But I'm lonely all the time. I didn't make myself this way. I didn't ask for this hunger or these hooves and horns. I got nothing against a thing. It's just I'm hungry all the time. Does my mother remember me? Does she think of my dad as a gift? When I smell the blood of a brother, I rush through the dark corners and throw myself toward the bright, bright swing of his heroic sword. Take my head back with you and dumbfound the world. Oh, that's great. Yeah, excellent, Brent. Uh, the Minotaur, I love uh, just the, the humanizing sadness of that. That's a, a different look on that story. Thanks for sharing that. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks, yeah. Tim. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, yeah, everybody. Take care, Brent. Yep. All right. Let's go to Jennifer Lee Swang next. Hey, Tim. Hey, Jen. How are you doing today? I'm good. So, so, so what have you got for us? Uh, so I got a prompt poem. Uh, this weekend was the Mid-Autumn Festival mm-hmm. uh, in Asian cultures. So I decided to write about the story of the moon goddess Chang'e. Oh, interesting. And uh, there's two different versions, but basically they both end with her taking the elixir of immortality and fleeing to the moon, separating from her lover. Like, oh, that's uh, the, the, um... the difference is in one version, he's really cruel and she chose it. The other version is that his uh, assistant was going to steal the elixir. So she did it as a preventative method. Mm-hmm. But I thought I would do my own take where yeah. uh, kind of a, a modern take on the story. Yeah, very cool. Let's hear it. Woman on the Moon. Yeah. Scholars and writers like to paint my story as a tragic romance, but there was no love, only the patriarchal expectation of marriage. I was naive enough to believe that maybe the sentiment would grow, but you only loved yourself, so I took away the opportunity for immortality and a legacy written in a liquid thicker than ink. 
I escaped to the moon with only my rabbit. And you know what? I was fine up there. We eat all the cakes we want without worrying about how weight, how much weight we gain and how much how weight gain would look would make you look bad. And I smile with the mysterious cat that Westerners said was up there. Maybe you'll call me a crazy cat lady, but I learned that to be alone is not the equivalent of being unsatisfied. So every month I make the moon shine fully to remind those like my younger self that they are already whole. Oh, very cool. That's a great, great twist on the legend that uh, um, being alone is not the equivalent of being unsatisfied. Very cool. Excellent, Jen. Thanks so much for sharing that. Thank you. Yeah, always a pleasure. It was Jennifer Lise Wang. And uh, Barbara Taylor is up next. Or Tyler, yeah. sorry, Barbara Tyler. That's, that's okay. <laughs> how yeah. are you doing tonight, Barbara? I'm, I'm okay. How are you, Tim? I'm great. So uh, so what is it that you have for us? Um, I had a uh, poem from The Prompt as well uh-huh. from last week. Excellent. Uh, a good year. Um, and a is good there anything you want to say yeah. about it before we start? Uh, no, it's pretty self-explanatory <laughs> again. Okay, cool. Go ahead. A good year. The vintage was first century. They knew not what they were tasting, only that it was good, the best they'd ever had. Like manna once again from heaven, sweet honey cake flavor, refreshing liquid, refreshing the soul. In the beginning, it was pure water, poured into earthen jars, then transfigured, fragrant with hints of pomegranate and fig, cloves and sea salt, incense and myrrh, only a chosen few detecting a slight bitterness. For years, at future gatherings, the fortunate who attended that memorable feast recounted the miraculous wine, claiming, this is good, but not like that wedding in Cana, recalling its goodness had left them sated and yet a little thirsty for something more. Oh, excellent. A good year. Wonderful poem. Thanks so much for sharing that, Barbara. Thank, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah, always a pleasure. All right. And then last but not least is Guy Chambers. Good evening, Guy. How you doing? Not bad. How you doing there? I'm doing I got a pump great. poem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I got a pump poem here. I'm having trouble my where in where did uh my Wi Fi here, so I hope I can get this in. Okay, well if it starts and to be uh, choppy, just turn your video off. But right now it seems fine. Yeah, okay, like uh, this is my pump poem. I got a short uh, micro poem I got coming up here too, so yeah, I got two here. Okay. It, yeah, yeah. If it's if it's tiny yeah. you can do t- you do a second yeah. tiny one, that's fine. Okay. Okay. This one's called The Hill. I wrote this this afternoon, it just came up the idea. Excellent. Jack and Jill went up the hill with a pail in a hand to check the still. There too to find out if the new brine will be just fine. Jack tests the moonshine. It's a nine. It's so refined. This will make up a bottom line for those customers down the coastline. Jack tests the moonshine furthermore and furthermore Jill shuts out stop at four remember what happened before and you won't be able to able to bottle the score we got to get down the hill and to get the orders filled Jack and Jill head down the hill with a pill in hand full from the still Jack was so drunk, he stumbled and spilled a pill of shine and broke his crown. Jill has a fit. There's goes a prophet, you half wit. You drink until you're saturated. You, tr- you should drink moderate. Now we can lose the market. <laughs> that's really funny another one i was trying not to laugh is jack yeah. test the moonshine yeah great yeah. imagination there guy I, and then for my microphone there mm-hmm. i got the call it the other side love never dies even on the other side oh that's excellent that's too it. other side yeah thanks so much guy always a pleasure talking to you yeah i was gonna say i was gonna announce that i got about 10 poems coming up and three different books being published coming up as in a couple of months here so there's going to be Quite exciting. There we got five and one at the, from the 
Strathcona County uh, Writers Group, and uh-huh. then the one with uh, from out of Calgary is uh, the, the Prairie Journal. I got four coming up in there, and I got one with the Parkland Ports. That's out of Stony Plain, Alberta, Canada. That's so that's just wonderful to hear. Yeah, yeah, congratulations, yeah, okay. guy. Okay. Yeah, it's great to hear Thanks all the different stuff going on all over the place. Yeah, yeah, take care. Yeah, and I, and that's all I like to say about for January there. She has some great, some pretty good lines there in some of her poems. Oh, she, she sure great. does. Yeah, she sure does. Thanks, yeah, guy. I gotta go go back and. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye. Yep. Yep. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, Guy Chambers with the uh, other side, and the hill, and uh, that is gonna be it for the open lines. I'm gonna I'll look through a little bit, but I'm gonna click click off the uh, Zoom. So um, get wave to everybody who's still there, and the meeting for all. And um, we are going to. Actually, I, I guess I could keep the Zoom open, but the problem is that that I'm not ready, and then people come back and and want to do more poems, and it kind of throws off the flow a little bit. So. If you weren't there yet, you missed your chance. But we have, um, let's see. So this is um, Lisa Ellison, I believe. Yeah, she has a prose poem for us. And maybe I'll um, tend to get it. Or was this for, let's see. Oh, it was for the critique. Never mind. I want to look up something bad. Let's do, uh, I'll read Ted Guevara's. And then Nivy has a video again. Um, or no, she's just going to be asking me too. Okay. So this is Nivy's poem. Um, she says, I've attempted to write a prompt poem based on the fairy tale with a twist. I chose Alice in Wonderland and everything is in her mind. Or is it our mind? More than a retelling, this poem is as much of a rambling mess as our minds are and shows just how unpredictable the mind is. And shows how much a prisoner of our own of our mind, how much at the mercy of its whims we are, how we all of us are struck and stuck in an asylum, the asylum of our thoughts and memories. Excellent, yeah, thanks so much. Um, here is a, the asylum. This is Nivy's poem, and uh, she apologizes for not being able to do the video this week, but that's no problem, Nivy. I'm happy to read your poem anytime you want. So here we go, Nivy's poem, um, uh, the asylum. The Asylum. The doctor was late today, and he never was, Alice knew. But suddenly the door opened and silhouetted by the light. There he was, a different doctor, a tall, lean one this time. How many more would visit her? She was not mad. She had grown tall and then shrunk small, and had played croquet with flamingos and teed with her the hatter and rabbit. And now here came another quack, looking at her strangely. Tuning out his voice, she stared at him and his white coat over. Was that a silk jacket? Oh, how she missed Rabbit. Then he opened his mouth to talk, and she she looked out the barred window and thought she spied a grin in a tree. So she turned around and she looked down at the tiny desk, the tiny desk in her room, unwilling to listen to him, the tiny desk that was now full of items, items he had arranged, a pocket watch, a kettle, a teacup, a saucer, a tiny slice of cake, a queen of hearts playing card. She looked up to hear him ask, so why is a raven like a writing desk? And that is how Alice entered the asylum, the asylum of her mind, your mind, our minds. That was Nibby DeCarthic with a great poem. Um, It's a spinoff on Alice in Wonderland, the asylum. Thanks so much for sharing that, Nibby. I have one more poem to read. Uh, This is from Ted Guevara. And this is Nexus, and he's got, he's always includes imagery too. And so here is, um, this looks like Sam, uh, is it Samson, right? Who destroys the, the pillars in, the, in that mythology. Here's the, the picture you included. And then he also has this um, a picture of Rapunzel here, letting down her hair. Beautiful painting. I wish I knew who'd, who'd done this, but great, great painting there. And here is the poem. This is Nexus by Ted Bernal Guevara. Let down your hair sounds musical even in biblical times, not necessarily during the necessity of miracles. Samson didn't witness one till he was blinded and enslaved by people who can afford the finest shampoo. Rapunzel would certainly come down from her tower and smell the fragrance up close. No witch would be caught sporting beautiful hair, but Rapunzel would break fairy tale standard to be close to the bouncing, lilting Samson. She would definitely scold that woman Delilah, for suppressing her inner hots for the Nazarite. I mean, look at him, 
Philistine bitch don't know what she had. If Rapunzel had an iPhone, she would snap the glorious nests of Samson and post it on Instagram. This, she would boast, is my boo for all time, my soul myth. If you get her drift, people all over the land would think she's a class act with follicles and an IQ. But Samson had sprawling veins on his arms. Those huge stone columns would not move an inch if betrayals from women escaped his life of labor and humility. He was not a comics model. He would be the one helping the weakling. He wouldn't kick sand for the purpose of vanity. God saw a beach in him, but also clashing waves, ones that would ruin blonde curls. Rapunzel realizes she must climb down her tower to prove the shallowness of this thought process. She has will. She pitches her iPhone out the window, grows weary how it would look, still look with her, waterfall of golden gravity. Samson reads her and telepathically transmit a bunch to her effort, a brush to her effort. God, he says, is not sparing your despair, but handing you conditioner to untangle your snags. He is my strength in all my pensive suffering and confusion for all time. Rapunzel clicked her tongue at the window in the crisp morning air, closed her lovely eyes and said, honey, don't ever think of doing that hair a mullet. <laughs> So there it is. That is Ted Bernal Govera's poem, Nexus. Thanks so much for sharing that, Ted. Uh, another fun one. A fun prompt this week. A lot of fun stuff. Um, and that is going to be the show for the week. Thanks, everybody, for uh, watching. Now, um, I guess it's Saiku time first before I say it's the show. And the Saiku for the week is right here. This is an interesting study. It's a mouse study out of uh, Columbia's University Zuckerman Institute. Here it is on the screen. If I can make it small enough that you can actually read it um, here. Well, it's still not small enough. They like big fonts these days. You ever notice that? Let's see. Can I squeeze it on the screen? Okay. Cravings for fatty foods trace to gut-brain connection. Mouse research reveals fat sensors in the intestines that stimulate the brain and drive food desires. And so what they found, they, they, they manipulated these mice to see what was going on. Um, they made it so they could not taste sweetness, and yet they still crave sweetness. So it's not actually the taste of sweetness that makes you crave things. It's actually special receptors in your gut that tell you you need food. And so there was an interesting way that the, the lead scientist here put it. Um, where did it go, though? She said, um, our research is showing that the tongue tells our brain what we like, such as thing that, things that taste sweet, salty, or fatty, um, said Dr. Zucker. Um, who's also a professor of biochemistry and blah, blah, blah. The gut, however, tells our brain what we want, what we need. So um, so the, the tongue tells you what you like, but the gut tells the brain what you need. And uh, I think there's a Rolling Stone song tied up in there somewhere. That is the uh, article this week. And then the Saiku is right here. And so I should say this has uh, implications for like artificial sweeteners. And that's why that if you, um, that's why diet soda doesn't really work because you're craving sugar. Um, and your body, even though it tastes sweet, your body, your gut can tell that you're not actually, um, getting the sweetness you crave. And so that's why, you know, you just want more sugar anyway, and then you end up eating more anyway and diet soda doesn't really work, even though, you know, sugar is pretty bad for you in general at that level. <laughs> so, um, here's the Saiku though for this week. Um, stirring in artificial sugar, the cup not full. Stirring in artificial sugar, the cup not full. That is your Saiku for this week. And the prompt for next week, this comes from uh, uh, January, is um, write about a bruise or a scar, internal or external. Very simple, uh, very simple prompt this week, a one-liner. Write about a bruise or a scar, internal or external. That was uh, January Gill O'Neill's prompt for us. So let's see if we can write some poems about that and come back next week and share them. Now, next week's guest in the Rattlecast is going to... B, um, Jesse Randall. And this is going to be cool, especially uh, for uh, Jennifer Lee's Wang, a, a woman scientist herself. Um, Jesse Randall's a librarian, so she was in her librarian's issue, but her latest book is Mathematics for Ladies, Poems on Women in Science. Um, so that's going to be the guest on Rattlecast number 160. Jesse is just one of the most creative poets that I have ever come across. She does a lot of different things. Her books are always very interesting. Haven't cracked this one open yet, but I'm sure this is as well. Um, uh, that's Mathematics for Ladies by Jesse Randall. Rattlecast number 160, the prompt to write about a bruise or a scar. Um, and that's going to be at the regular time, Monday, September 19th, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Hope you have a great week in the meantime, and I will talk to you later.
Good night.